left what were initially my, my difficulties in, uh, in starting to, to program in C++. And I was used to doing MATLAB, um, like many of you guys, right? So my initial difficulty was, first of all, to understand the difference between a scripting language and, uh, and a compiled language. So do you guys have an idea of what, uh, what the difference is? Uh, yeah. Do you understand what the difference is? Like, in a compiled language, you need to compile a code, right? And make, so it go from a user readable piece of text file to something that the machine uh, can run, right? So the process is always to write the code and then compile the code into executable and then executable can run typically much faster than like a MATLAB code, right? Or a scripting language size such as Python or MATLAB. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do today is just to go through this simple process once, just create a simple file, compile it, and then we see how to uh, include other people's library and, um, and use them in your code. Okay? One of the libraries will be, of course, the modlib library, right? And maybe today we can uh, create a mesh and uh, operate with the mesh, which is going to be an object. Uh, make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what you need is an editor. So maybe I can share my screen now, right? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so how do I do that? Oh, share screen. So in order to start, and you guys can do what I do on your machines. Uh, in order to start, I will just go to like any folder, say in your computer. And uh, so you can create a folder called, uh, let's be classical, hello world, right? So, uh, so now we have this folder, right? And uh, what do we need in this folder? We just need a file, which typically, if, like your main file is just called main.cpp, extension cpp stands for C++, right? So in this file, you may want to have, I'm just copying something from somewhere else, but in this file, you just have at the moment, an empty main.cpp file, like this. Okay, so let's compile the simplest program. And uh, so the starting point of a program is always a function that is called main. And that function has a certain uh, signature a function in C++ or in C always starts with the type of return, right? So the main will be a function which returns an integer. So it starts with int, right? And then you go like int main, open parentheses, close parentheses. And then th there's a body of the function which is encapsulated in uh, curly brackets, right? So that's it. So this is an empty program. Okay. So all we want to do in this, uh, we'll start very simple, but we'll speed up pretty quickly. So um, all we want to do in this simple program, just to understand the concept of, of compiling, is um, just say, uh, we'll print out something to the screen, right? So in order to print out something to the screen in C++, you can do std, double column, C out, and then the dub, double less equal operator, and then the string hello world. And then you close the statement with std, double column, and the L, which is end of the line. Right? Okay, now we're gonna tell the compiler to create a program. So compile a program that does this. 
and you tell me when you're ready. And uh, there should be already a problem that you see with this program. Uh, so let me give you a hint. The problem is, what is STD C out and what is STD and 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 line? What are those things? Uh, those things are objects. And uh, these objects are standard objects. So every uh, C++ environment, so every compiler basically, comes with what is also called, what is called the standard library. Standard library is a library, right, that uh, is defined by a, a standard, the C++ standard, and it contains a bunch of things. For example, it contains many algorithms, many types of containers, and um, also a lot of features for input output. Everything that is, whatever uh, basic needs are in programming is pretty much contained in the standard library. Right, so what we are using the standard library for in this simple line, uh, simple single line of code, is outputting a string to the controller, right? In order to do this, we need this object as to be Where is this object? This object is the part of the library, which is called IO string, or for input output string. This is a header file that comes with a... I think <laughs> This is a um, header file that comes with the standard library. And so in order to use it, you just have to say include, in, in include IO stream. Okay. So after you say, after you type include IO stream, then you have access to a bunch of functionalities that are coming with the IO stream header. How do you know which ones? Well, you can just, for example, go online, right? And just Google IO stream. And uh, this is a nice website that I always use. Uh, it's called c++.com. And if you click on, on the link that comes up, the IO stream, this describes the standard library header IO stream, right? So it tells you what's in there. What's in there is C in, C out, C air, C log, a bunch of objects that are ready for you to do input output, right? So what is C out? You see it in this line here, C out is the standard output stream. So it is the object that takes care of sending whatever message you want to print to the standard uh, output, which in this case is the terminal, the, the console you're running with it. Okay, so what, what this line of code we wrote does Right? If you look at it now, um, with this knowledge, you can, you can better understand what it does. So C out is an object that belongs to the STD library, the standard library. So STD double column is basically a, 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 a prefix, right? And C, uh, for, for standard, and C out is an object or maybe you could, you could even have a function that belongs to the standard library. Make sense? And also NDL, you can see it's an object that belongs to STD. So uh, what that does is just uh, ending a line of text. Later on, uh, today we are going to use, for example, we're gonna uh, start using mathematical operations, right? And so we're gonna have to um, have other than the standard library, for example, we're gonna have a 
a math library, I typically use the eigen library in the code. And the modlib library is a library itself. So if we have, for example, the eigen library, right, and we want to use one of the objects defined in the eigen library, we would do eigen, for example, double column matrix, right? So this is exactly the same syntax as std double column cl. Right, so the double column basically says that that object matrix belongs to the um, library icon. Uh, if we want to use, for example, the mesh class that we have in the modlib library, we would do model double column, for example, simplicial mesh, something like that. Okay, so this is just to train your eye in understanding what uh, this double, double column operator is, right? So let's get rid of this for now, actually. All right, so now we have a piece of text and uh, we need to make the computer execute this text, right? So in, in MATLAB or Python, you will just uh, kind of execute this directly, right? And the, in, in a scripting language, uh, all the commands here would be interpreted on the fly and executed on, on the pro, uh, proper environment. If we have a compiled language, we have to compile this into an executable. So how do we do this? Just take, just take a terminal, right? And... Um, You cd into this low word folder. Okay. And uh, we're going to compile this code. And it, so we need to invoke the compiler. The C compiler is typically. In a in a the new comp there, there are several compilers right I hope that you all have the new compiler if you do you invoke the compiler by saying G plus plus and then G plus plus takes the command takes us um, a series of inputs and the first input is the file that you want to compile so it's main dot cdp and then you have you have to say uh, what is the name of the object file or, or executable that you want to compile this into. So you go like minus O or object file, and then whatever name of, ex of an executable, let's say hello. Right. You press enter, and then your code gets compiled into the hello executable. Is this happening for everybody? Uh, Giacomo, I have a question here yes. for the compilers. I'm uh, now switching to the Microsoft. Uh, do you uh, have a recommendation for the compiler on uh, uh, on the PC? Because uh, I, I should, I'm not too expert, but it should be Visual Visual Studio. Visual Studio. Okay, that's what I kind of was looking at. All right. Yeah. Okay. Can change this to CPP Yeah, main Yeah, main Minus O is detached from main Oh, I should have the Yeah. minus O Minus O is telling is a flag for the compiler which is followed by the name of the, of the object file or the ex executable uh, is the, okay. the executable name. So basically I'm saying I want to compile this and put in an into executable that. file. In exactly. This you want to compile main.cpp into the executable hello. So you have an error. Okay, the include iostream is not like this. So you go like include. So include this like this, and I have stream is in, uh, oh, okay. like this. Okay, that makes sense. 
Okay. Yeah, so this is exactly the way I wanted this session to go. Like, you guys do exactly what I do, and then we we'll just move forward together and uh, until we reach more difficult cases. Right now. Would you have does this matter? Doesn't that one, they don't really matter in this room? No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. You can even interrupt a, a line of code and go to the next line without any problems. Okay. Each line, however, I forgot to mention an important thing. Each, uh, not each line, each um, statement must end with a semicolon. Okay. Do you have that? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. For those like things, then you can use the semicolon. No, because this is a function, so you don't. So this compiled for everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So how do you run your code? Uh, you just go dot slash, then the name of the executable you gave to the code, and they should print like no word, right? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So coffee break now. No. <laughs> um. All right. So now. Let's uh, define some variables and uh, and play with them a little. Uh, say that uh, so I'm, again, I'm um, the examples I'm making is always to highlight the difference between a scripting language and a compiled language. So um, in MATLAB, say you want to define the variable a to be 0 0.5. So you will just do a equals 0 0.5, right? So you could type that. So I need to give the sample to Tina and I can say, but you can continue making it. Okay. Yeah. So we just they say a equals 0 0.5, and if you try compile, uh, and then semicolon, right, to the end of the line, and let's try to compile this again. By the way, when you recompile, you can just press the up arrow to bring up the uh, old commands in your terminal. You don't have to retype everything again. Again, one more. Uh, oh, recompile. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you need to recompile, right? And if you say that there's an error in the code, right? Oh, I didn't say just that way. Yeah. There should be an error now in the code. Maybe you could record the session. I'll do a better job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should get an error. Yeah, yeah error. Okay. You're not getting an error. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, you don't save it. Save the text file first. <laughs> The Warren's compiler is about to die. Everybody says. Really? Yes. 
So, Professor, I expected all these little delays, so that's why I'm saying we're going to need several <laughs> sessions. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is a very good training because it's hands on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, am I outside? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, guys, so what's the problem? The problem is that, okay, let's read the error. The error saying A was not declared in the scope, right? So there's a difference in a compiled language between, or, or especially in C++, right? Between the declaration of a variable and the, the definition of a variable, okay? So what we have done here is the definition. We have defined A to be 0 0.5, but we haven't declared what A is. So what does declaring mean? We have to declare what type the variable A is. So for example, we could say double, double A equals 0 0.5. Right. Why do we have to do that? Because the compiler has to allocate the proper memory um, space in the program. For example, a double takes a certain amount of, of memory, right? And an integer takes a different amount and so on and so forth. So that it can optimize your code and uh, run faster. In a scripting language, this doesn't happen. And this is why one of what, the script languages cannot, can never be as fast as a compiled language, right? So we're allocating the proper amount of memory and uh, we are, so in this line, we have, we're doing two things, right? So we could split actually this line into two lines. We could say double A, semicolon, and in the next line, A equals 0 0.5. So in this way, we'd, we would have, in the first line, declare the variable, and in the second line, define the variable, right? You can do this in one line and just say double A equals 0 0.5, all right? So this is a very important thing to understand, and uh, the example of a double is the, probably the simplest or one of the simplest, right? But when we use more complicated types, always remember, that although the language may look different, I mean, may look difficult to read, the structure is always that you declare a type of a variable and then you operate with that variable. In, the, in this case, the operation is just assignment of a value. Okay? Okay, let's uh, make things a little bit more complicated. So let's say that instead of um, one value, A, we want to store into a container a bunch of values, of values, right? So now we start to think about containers. So if you were writing a C program, uh, the, the, in, a, in a C program, you wouldn't have 
any type of uh, pre uh, of of um, um, of containers. The only type of container is a, is a is an array, is a pointer array. So we're not going to go into that. One of the main advantages of C++ is actually that together with the standard library come a bunch of different types of containers that are ready for you to use. And you should always use those whenever is um, pretty much all the times. Don't, don't come up with your own type of containers because they're not going to be efficient compared to what's in the uh, standard library, right? Container looking for? So a container, so there are several types of containers and we're going to go through them uh, right now because I think it's very important to have a good understanding of the different types of containers and how to use them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to cover one by one. And uh, so the, the simplest type of container is the so-called vector. So how do we use a vector? Well, a vector is part of the standard library, right? So we can just include it. So we can just say, after the IO stream include um, line, we can just put include vector, right? So now if you understand that you're including vector from the standard library, how do you use a vector? Well, you just say uh, STD for standard, right? Vector. A vector of what? A vector of, let's say, double. Let's say, let's call this uh, V. Okay. So let's go through this line a little bit more carefully. So STD vector, STD double column vector means that vector is uh, a type that is defined in the STD library. And the part of this line that says STD vector double V is actually, if you, is actually the same as the syntax double A, if you, if you are careful, uh, if you read it carefully. So STD vector is the def def declaration of a type and V is the variable. In exactly the same way as double A is the declaration of a type and A is the variable, all right? So the type is uh, a vector, but the double you specify the numbers of the, the vector. Yeah, so the, the overall syntax STD vector of double is the type. Because a vector of double is a different type than a vector of int. Or a vector of floats. Okay. We're going to go, th this is called a template, template parameter. We're going to go into that maybe a little bit later. but. Uh, STD vector double, the, the, the overall thing, the overall line is the definition of the type. Declaration of the type, not definition, declaration of the type. All right? So you don't need to specify the size of the vector? No, you don't need to specify the size when you construct the vector. Okay? So what is a vector, first of all? A vector is a type of container which belongs to the um, uh, category of so-called sequential container. Mm -hmm. So imagine that a vector, what, what a vector does is it stores elements. In this case, the elements are double, right? And uh, in the memory, all these doubles are one next to the other. This is the meaning of sequential, right? If you have a sequential container, you can always go from you can always transverse the, map, the, the transverse, transverse the container from the first element, for example, to the last element, and all these elements are one next to the other in the order in which you insert them. In. All right, so let's make an example. So let's say we want to insert a bunch of doubles, right, in this vector, then we would do, then, then the question is how do I insert a, a, an, an element in the, in the vector, right? Well, let me tell you how, and then we're gonna look at the website for other options. We're gonna say v dot push underscore back, and then a number, let's say 1.0. And then the next line, we're gonna say v push back, let's say 3.0. And again, v push back 2.0. 
right? Okay, let's look at this syntax. We are using the dot, right, uh, on the object V. So whenever you have an object, there are functionalities that you can call. Uh, and these functionalities you access through the dot operator. Now, the question is, what fun how do I know that there is a pushback uh, function that I can call, right? Then you just go online, right? And you Google std vector. And this website shows up again, right? I'll show you on this one. Okay, the, here, this page describes the STD vector, right? And what we are interested in here is the section that describes the member functions. So you see that um, there is a section that says modifiers here, and there is this command pushback. And what this does is adds an element at the end of the config. Right, so the pushback keeps, every time you call pushback, you're putting at the end of the container a new element. So it's kind of, um, the one we did is 182, so it's going first, element is one, eight to another. Right, exactly, I, I did this on purpose. The sequence of, so element, the first element is one, the second element is three, the third element is two, okay? All right. Um, so you see that there, there are several uh, things you can call, several functions you can call on this vector. We're just using uh, push back, but uh, we could also say pop back to delete the last element from the container. We could say, for example, erase to clear all the memory in the vector, right? No, no, sorry, we say clear to clear all the content and, uh, and other, other operators. So let's, let's make sure that now we have these elements in the container. So what we're gonna do is combine now. Uh, um, combine the C out with the vector. Sorry, my wife building seems to have gone on fire, so. <laughs> um, okay, so now what we want to do is print all the elements in the order in which we put them in, right? So in order to do this, we're gonna create a for loop and uh, use the C out operator to print all the elements. How do we do this? We say for, and we could say, for example, int, and uh, say k equals zero, k less than b dot size, k plus plus, or, or plus plus k, it's the same thing. And inside we can say std c out d, Okay, so what we're doing here, we're creating a for loop, that is the syntax to create a simple for loop. Uh, so we have an index k that runs from zero, because uh, C++ is zero base, right? Um, so when you index something, you start indexing from zero. Um, so k runs from zero to the number which precedes the size of v. Look how we got the size from v. We said v dot size, so size must be 
one of the functions that we find here on the website, right? In fact, if you check here on the website under the capacity section, there is a function size that returns the size of that container. Uh, Giacomo, for this website, I have, uh, it, uh, how do you, uh, do you log on? I have c++.com, uh, is that what, what it is? But the interface is a little bit different. Yeah. Is, uh, okay, I can see it, yeah, yes. So how do you search, uh, because it has the information, tutorials, and so forth. So where are you now? On what oh, okay. What I do, I simply Google STD vector, and then I mm -hmm. pick the search result, which is the c++.com website. Yeah, okay. I, so I have that one here, but if you want to, uh, on that interface, how did you find oh. STD vector properties? Okay, so if you scroll, if you are in the, on the space, STD vector, are you there? No. How do you get there? Oh, I just Googled STD vector like this, STD double column vector. Oh, and then it just that, that puts you directly onto the library? And, but what if you I are on... This, and then I picked this uh, search result. Oh, just a search result from Google. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Or you can search vector within the website here. Within the website, okay. With the cpasplus.com. All right. Where, yeah. do, where do you use this smaller, smaller sign every time you want to call a, a class or something? No, these are input-output operations. So basically, you're sending, okay, so you're sending this. This meaning is that you're sending DK to, to, to Xiao. That's one operation. And then you're sending NDL to Xiao also. So Xiao, oh. is, you can think of it as your console. Okay. So you're sending something, and then you're sending end of the line. So that okay. the, when you erase the next line, it goes to the you know, right? Okay, so, so every time you call an object from a class, you're just putting double? Not, not always, uh, we're, but it's good practice, I think. Okay. Yeah, you can avoid that, but... Uh, all right, so let's compile this, right? And, uh, and run. We should print one three two for everybody. Okay. Is that happening for everybody? Okay. Happening? Yeah. Compiling and running, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, you guys have questions so far? Um, whatever comes to your mind, like any syntax uh, difficulty? Or um, no? So All right. Not including, not including the size, right? Because it's zero based. 
So if you have five elements, those are zero, one, two, three, four. No, there are five elements, five numbers between zero and four. So if the size is five and you're indexing based on a zero based system, these elements are zero, one, two, three, four. So you go from zero to the size to less than the size. Which is, so you're gonna include the number, the index value five. Okay? I was hoping that someone asked this question, but the question, um, the what question, the question, the question one asked is in MATLAB you can just output to the screen like the, the whole array in one yes. shot, right? Here you have to for loop. Okay, so. The the reason for this is um, that we have created a very simple case where the vector is a vector of doubles. So of course you know how to output the double, right? It just you output the number, but as we're gonna see in a few minutes, you can create a vector of any type you define. So for example, in this location dynamics uh, code, or let's say a more complicated code, you can create a vector of, let's say, these locations, okay? Whatever this location means in your code. So now the question is, how do you output a dislocation by default? There is no default way, right? You have to define a way out to the this location. Uh, what, what, does, what, what that means, and uh, because there is no default way in general for a square for a linear type, you cannot by default output something from the vector, right? That's the reason. Because vector is much more flexible than the MATLAB array. It can hold whatever type, and outputting for a certain type is not defined. Right, so let's do that now. Okay, so just to give you a feeling of what is going on. Okay, so as I said, uh, vector. Um, so here we have defined a vector of doubles, right? But we could define, so the flexibility of C++ is that you can put, all of, the, of the standard library containers, that you can put in these containers really whatever you want. So, Mm -hmm. um, now, what we're going to do next is create a container of a type that we define. All right. So let's define a type. How do we define a type? In order to define the, uh, a new type. So first of all, what are the built-in types? Built-in types are like integer doubles, uh, strings, uh, characters, or whatever you have in the same method, right? Now what we're gonna create now is a new class or in MATLAB this will be a new structure, right? So we do this outside of the main function and uh, we define, for example, let's say class. Uh, let's define a class named um, capital A, right? The syntax of this is that the class body is enclosed into in curly brackets, and the uh, curly bracket is ended by a semicolon, right? Inside the body of the function, there are typically two sections, and a private by default is the, the, the private section is by default, and the public section you have to declare, all right? Okay, so, The main, uh, yeah, so this will be enough for now. Of course, it's a dummy, dummy thing, right? But uh, if we have this class A, then uh, what we have defined is a new type, and the type is A. And the type A is not, not doing anything, right? So what if we have this A, we can actually declare an object capital A, down here and call it, let's say, whatever. <laughs> uh, actually, let's change the name of the class here. Let's say, let's call this, uh, let's say, my type. 
or my class, my class, something like that, right? So we're gonna say down here, my class uh, B. Okay, so again, the syntax is exactly the same as double A, you see? There's a uh, declaration of what B is, B is an object of type my class. And my class is now a user defined object that we have just defined up here. Make sense? So if you had this uh, my, my new new type, you could actually create a vector of these objects. So down here we're gonna say std vector of my class. And we call this uh, V1. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try to compile this. See that we didn't make any mistakes. Of course, this is not doing anything, right? All right. Okay, let's actually operate and do something with this my class, right? Um, so let's say that my class is some type of prototype of a, uh, of a vector of three elements of, of coordinates x, y, z, right? So my class inside may store, for example, a double x, a double y, and a double z. Okay. Then, actually, uh, yeah, so we would like to, now each, the, the object B, right, now can have, with the object B, now you could do B dot X to access the X value equal, let's say, 3.5, B dot Y equals 4.8, and B dot Z equals 9.0, something like that, right? If you try to compile this, the compiler is gonna throw an error. So let's try and read the error and try to understand what that is. You, should, you guys should get something like, my class X is private within this context, or something like that, right? What is the problem? The problem is that we have defined the members X, Y, and Z within the private section, which is the default section of the class. If we want to access these values, these need to go into the public section. First of all, why is there a private section and a public section, right? The reason is that, um, for example, Let's say I write a code, right? And so I write a certain set of, of classes, certain, like for example, the modlib library, right? And then someone else is going to use these classes and other projects, right? Then if I want to make sure that some, da some data is not touched by the user, then that data will go into the private section of a class. Otherwise, if you want to allow the data for public access, right, you put it in the public section of the class. So if we now move, or let's say that we want to allow whoever is using this type my class to modify these values, you just put them, copy and paste into the public section of the class, and then you are going to be able to 
compile this code. Right? Okay. So why would you want to store something that the user cannot change? So what would be like that? Why? Yeah, so what kind of information is that? Is it because it's like variable or something? Uh, okay, so let me give an example. For example, um, in the in the file in the, uh, in the in the mesh class, right? That we're going to use in a, in a few minutes. Uh, let's say that I don't want, um, for example, the user to. Uh, I don't want the user to, let's say, destroy a triangle without destroying the corresponding tetrahedron because that would create memory problems. Now you have a tetrahedron, right? Yeah. Object, you don't want to, to operate or destroy, for example, one of its faces without destroying the, the tetrahedron. There are some topological okay. constraints, for example, right, which you don't want the user of the class to, to mess with, not to make mistakes, right? So you only give access to certain a set a subset of data and certain operations and something else you protect within the class and uh, so that, uh, that that is for your own protection and for user protection right it's like for safety of, of the code oh. make sense yeah exactly. uh, all right so um Okay, so let's see now. Uh, we have this vector of my class. We want to create several ob objects of this type, right? So what I would like to do is something like this. I would like to push into this vector v1. So v dot push back. Um, see, I could push back b like that, right? So this would compile no problem. You can try, right? But this syntax is a little bit cumbersome because see, you have to create B, you have to assign the values of X, Y, Z, and then push B into the container. There's a lot of overhead in doing this. So let's, so let's perform this operation in a slightly more efficient way. So first of all, we would like to be... Giacomo, I have a question here. Sure. For the, <clears throat> to load the, um, uh, the data into, let's say, the vector, uh, yes. use the pushback uh, operator here to put one, three, two. Yeah. And I'm going to use it again. Um, also, you use the equal sign uh, to load up the 5.6, 6.4.8. Uh, are these two methods equivalent to uh, assignment of the data into the elements? Uh, no, these are slightly different things. Okay, so we have two, two different um, objects here. One is the object B that is of type my class, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have V1. V1 is a container of objects of type my class. So the equal sign here is to assign the value to one single object of type my class. And the pushback here is an operator that acts on the container of those objects. Mm. Yeah, okay. so, so in the previous way that you put the pushback 1.0, you were actually as, uh, loading the data into the vector uh, elements there. Yes. Like, so what so, you're saying is that the pushback yes, is like a general way to load the, the data into containers. And if yes, the container happens to be a vector, then you can either use an equal sign or a pushback? Not, not either. You don't have equal sign in a vector. So V1 is a vector, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot say equal sign for a vector unless you to the right of the equal sign is another vector. So you can assign a, 
You can assign well, that. I, no, I understand element by element, like the previous, uh, like line 42, 43, 44. Um, you're, you're actually loading the data element by element into, into this class B. Right. So isn't that like, uh, can you do the same thing with a pushback? No, you, you cannot. So, okay. Mm. So I'll try to... I'm a little confused. Okay. So basically, let, let's, uh, let's forget about line 46 and 47 for now. Uh, let's focus on 41 to 44. Uh, my class is defined up here. It's a new type. Yeah. Um, this type is... When I say my class B, I'm performing an operation similar to the line 27. Yeah. I have double A, right? I'm declaring a type and I'm declaring a variable of that type. Yeah. But, but it turns out that this variable is not a simple double. It's a, yeah. it's a variable of type my class, which has internal fields, X, Y, and Z. So these lines, I'm just assigning those fields in that variable, it's like a structure. Yeah. Mm. Then, okay. then we have this line 46 where we create a vector of this new type. So mm -hmm. each element of this vector is not x, y, and z. It is one of the b, one of the my class b. I type. understand, you. right, right. So this line here is equivalent to this line 30. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Now, when you push back like in line 31, you need to push back an element of the type defined within the, um, within the uh, triangle brackets. Yeah. In this case, I'm pushing in a double, right? Because the vector is a vector of double. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm pushing in a B because B is a, is a type of type my class, right? Right, right. Okay. I, can, I cannot do V1 equals 4.5 because um no and then yeah then i understand i think what i was saying is that like in line 31 for example yes you have said v of one equals 1 1.0 yes you could have done okay okay perfect that's what so, i was saying is that you just in the vector you can have you either you either push back or you can just assign the value, like V of 1 equals 1 1.0 would be the same, right? Pushback uh, you, you really does two operations. It, cre it allocates the memory for the element uh -huh. and assigns the, um, the, value. the value. Right. So if what if I say V of 1 equals 1.0? 1 V of zero, yes. So let's say we... Oh, okay. V of zero, okay. You're saying, just, you're saying this, right? Yeah, V of zero equals 1.0, yeah. Okay, this will create a segmentation fault. Let's try. Segmentation fault, right? Mm. Do you understand why? I, no, I don't. Okay, so this is because when you create the vector in line 30, this vector has zero size. And you're trying to access element, the first element, when memory for that element hasn't been allocated. Oh, I see. So the okay. pushback it allocates the memory then. Allocates and assigns and the value. Assigns at the same time. I see. Yeah. Yes. You can still do it. But it's very inefficient. So okay. this is. The forces yeah. Um, so one other way of doing this would be okay. I see to to uh, first allocate the memory and then to uh, have yes. one by one or just an array. You can put an array uh, uh, yes. equivalent. I see. So okay. To avoid the problem, you have to do. If you don't want to use pushback, you can do v dot resize. Let's say for example three elements. And then you can say V zero equals 1.0. Or can you say just V equals and then in between uh, brackets 1.0 comma 3.0 uh, comma 2. .0. Yes, yes, that's, uh, yes, that's for, simple, for simple cases you can do that too. Yeah, okay, I got it.
yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand the question very, yeah. very well. Okay. A more efficient way would be like the push factor because uh, that way it will allocate the memory and assign the values. But where we yeah. do like resize, you know, give a size, or then you can assign each value. Yeah, when you resize, um, you're actually constructing like dummy objects, right? So you construct. And then you assign, so you're changing that memory location twice, right? Um, Make sense? Yeah. I have another question, Jacob. Yeah. Let's say if you don't comment out the pushback lines, line 31, 32, and 33, and later you want to replace, for example, one with number nine, can you just later put V0 equal nine? Absolutely. So you're saying this, right? Yeah, let's say if you don't comment those. Uh, that's, that's, that's like yeah, that, that, that should work, yeah. That would, oh, that would work, okay. okay yeah. Because the memory is there, okay. the value is there, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. But how come for the class B, that didn't happen? We didn't really put memories for X, Y, Z, we didn't have initial values here. Okay, so yeah, I think we need to go back to that now. We have uh, had uh, some questions, but uh, can we go back to the my class example? Okay, so, so now if, what, you know, no segmentation fault. And your compiler is buggy. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe that uh, your system hasn't used that, that memory for some other operation. I mean, segmentation faults are not, it can happen, not happen, give completely wrong numbers or, right. Okay, so okay, so now we understand the pushback, the size, and the vector operators with with the doubles, right? So let's try to do something with the with the type my class. So for example, let's um, let's see. I would like to push back uh, the elements uh, in V one. In the same way, I pushed back the one, three, two in the vector V, right? So what I mean by this is without having to create the object V and assigning the value X, Y, Z. I would like to do everything in, in, in one line to avoid the creation of this, of this temporary here. So in order to do that, a preliminary step implies that when you create an object of type my class, you must be able to assign the values x, y, z on the fly at when you construct the object, right? So, so we want to replace this assignment here, v dot x, v dot y, v dot z. So, when, so for that, we need so-called constructor in the class my class. So the syntax of a constructor is like a, a special function that has the same name of the class. So the function is going to be my class again, and it's a public, in the public section because users need to be able to use it, right? So this is a function, so it's gonna take some arguments, and it's gonna have a body of the function. So the arguments go within uh, round parentheses, right? And the body goes within uh, curly parentheses, right? So what are the values that we want to pass to this function? They are the values of X, Y, and Z that we want to use to initialize the, uh, these terms, X, Y, Z. So let's say that this guy takes double, a double, let's call, let's say, X1, and then we have a double X2, and then we have a double X3, all right? Then the body of the function can do x equals x1 
y equals y1, z equals z1. All right? So this is a way, so if I have this, right? Now I could avoid these three lines, b dot x equals 3.5, b dot y equals 4.8, b dot z equals 9.0 and simply use the constructor by passing the three values, or values that I used before, okay. So B, when I construct B, I can use the parentheses operator for the constructor and pass the three values. So this avoids these three lines, okay. Um, so Giacomo, in this case, we will still have access to x1 and x2 and x3 as uh, public variables if I want to use them somewhere else? Yes, so after like you do this... Have, you will actually have values or the... Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, okay, so the 3.5, 4.8 and 9.0 are the values we pass, right? Uh -huh, but These the variables, are, yeah. Okay. Are stored, like x1 is stored into the x, Y1 is stored into Y and Z1 is stored into Z. So down here, if I say, for example, B dot X, right? The, for example, STD C out. So I want to print it, right? B dot X. This will print 3.5. Let's try. Um, it should be x2, x3 on the top there. Right? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. I meant to say y1 and uh, z1. Okay, 3.5. We never explicitly say b dot x is 3.5, right? Mm -hmm. But but the constructor has assigned the value 3.5 to x. So now after I have constructed the object, I can use b dot x and that is going to be 3.5. But, but the question is that is x1 a variable? Uh, like if I type, if I want to get uh, x1 by itself without... No, x1 uh, would be a, te a, temporary, a temporary variable that stores this value 3.5, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, that's a very good question. And uh, then you cannot access X1? It's not, a, yeah. it's not public? No, because see, the scope of X1 and uh, here. And here, I see. It's, it's within the class. Yes. So, although it's, so it's not public? No. Like it's not the variable in, X1 uh, stores the value X3.5 as mm, long as the constructor is active. Mm. Okay, okay. And the constructor stops right here, right? At yeah. the end of this line, this object yeah. is fully constructed. Yeah. So the function has been executed, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And these values are lost. But in the but process, if, they have yeah. been stored. Okay, but if you print it within the my class parentheses, it would yes. come out as x1, right? Exactly. So if I put okay. this line okay. here, okay. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And see here, I say x1, right? Yeah, just x1. Then it will come out. It will come out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three point five, three point twice, right? I got, I got it. Okay. Okay. This is temporary. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, this one, these, they can go anywhere. Actually. They can go in there. Which one are? Inan is saying, basically, how are you able to use the value x in line 15 before it is declared in line 25? Oh, okay. Uh, the compiler is smart enough that, and, it, and it, it's going to look for, if you're using something like, like this here, it's going to look within the class to see if you have declared that variable to be part of, uh, of the class. Oh, okay. So it's not going line by line. No, it's not going line by line. All right. So now, with this, uh, look what we can do. Instead of 
is if I want to create a vector of Bs, say, right? Uh, sorry, a vector of my class, instead of creating this temporary B and then pushing in B, I could also completely avoid this line and here say my class and then pass this. This also works. So if you have a bunch of a bunch of my class objects that you want to create and put in the container, you don't have to pre-create them and push them back. You can just do this. The yes, these ones, right? X one, Y one, Z one. Yeah. Dummy, because they're going to they're going to die at the end of the construction. I would say. Okay, now a little. Uh, can I have a question before you go? Oh. So uh, uh, that's very nice. So I understand now that if you have a vector, you can push back into it like a double precision uh, 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 in, or integer. Right, and then if you have you create now a class, so yes. the class that you created uh, is like a superstructure. But in this example you gave, it just has three uh, double precision numbers. Yes, so it would look like a vector basically. Yeah. So now you you're actually constructing a vector of vectors by the pushback of B. Yes. So each one you have a stack, and the stack if I look at them it will be. Um, like segments, or each segment has uh, B values of X1, Y1, Z1, and so on. Like exactly. That. Okay, so, but, so now if you have like a complex class and it has uh, other uh, operations other than just three numbers, right? then you push back into that, then how does it look like in the computer? Like, does, is it just stacking the sequence on top of each other or what? So if you have a vector, the vector is a sequential container. So all the elements in a vector are sequential in memory. Yeah. So if, if each element itself is a vector, then uh, that element is also co going to contain sequential elements. Yeah. But let's say the, uh, my class was not a vector, it was a matrix. Like I created a matrix mm -hmm. in my class. Instead of X, Y, Z, then I have... Yeah. Uh, nine elements like a, a stress tensor let's say yes and now i am um i am trying to load it like with this pushback uh procedure here um how is it is it going to take the the nine elements of the tensor and of the the first uh element of the class and then on top of that it has other elements or what in the memory, I think that the matrix is going to look like a, a, a linear array of nine numbers. Oh, I see. If you have a vector of these, then mm. you have each of these nine numbers stacked. Stack on top of each other. Yeah, and the pushback, the first one goes on the bottom of the... Of the um, yes, yes. You always push to the oh, bottom. I see. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So let's refine this code a little bit. Um, it's good practice not to initialize data members. So let's, tr let's use specific terminology now. X, Y, and Z, for example, in my class are data members because they are data, right? And they belong to the class, my class, so they are members of that class, data members. So that data members, you typically don't assign like this. For data members, there's a special thing you, you can do and you should do, which is called initialization list. Initialization list looks like this. After the name of the constructor, you put a semicolon. And then this stuff goes before the body in this way. And there's a good reason for doing this, but I want to delay the explanation a little bit. Okay, so if you have data members, each time you have a constructor, 
you should always initialize that data with an initialization list, not within the body of the constructor. This is a little detail that uh, you guys should just accept as uh, for now. And I want to give you a little bit more detail. Um, okay, say that And this is very important. So you should be very careful when about this, this part. Uh, notice that when we construct this object, my class, we're passing three numbers, right? X1, Y1, and Z1. Uh, we're passing doubles. These are very small objects, right? But um, in general, let's say you have a complicated class and um, Oh, so let me take a step back. So you pass in three numbers. And so what happens in reality is that the number 3.5 gets copied into the variable x1. And then the variable x1 is copied into variable x, right? So there are two copies involved in, in, in constructing x, right? Uh, the first copy is redundant because we're not really changing the value 3.5. So there's no need to copy the value 3.5, which is in some memory location into the memory location of X1 and then copy X1 into the memory location X. We could copy directly 3.5 into X, right? Of course, this is not a problem for the simple code, but let's say that X1 was a very large structure with a lot of data, right? In MATLAB, when you call a function, you always have to copy the old data to the function and then use that data, right? C++ offers you the possibility of not copying but working with the original object that you pass into this function. Make sense? This gets access to the location of the memory that that is stored instead that of copying over? That is the actual 3.5, right? So the same location. The same location, the same location, oh, okay? okay? So now, if that, if that object was a very large object, say, for example, an array of 5 million elements, right? Making this copy x1 would be extremely wasteful and, and slow, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we work with the actual 3.5 for value a? Very simple. We add after double this symbol. That's all you need. The symbol says that you're not passing a double, but you're passing a reference to a double. This is the symbol for a reference. A reference means? Location of memory. It, yeah, memory, me, reference means you're not copying the value into x into x1. You're actually working with the reference to the original people. Okay. This little detail, will save you a lot of time in computational code. So we're gonna do this pretty much every time you pass something to a function, all right? So now if I see out this and with Z1, it's gonna give me the location of Z1 stored in memory? It's gonna give you the value nine, right? Oh, okay. So this and Z1, is it gonna give up the location of the memory where nine is stored or is it gonna yeah. give the nine itself? It gives the nine itself. Oh, okay. This is not a pointer. Pointer will give you the memory location. This reference gives you the actual value, but works exactly like a pointer. Oh, okay. okay, so this is uh, something that you don't have in C, but you have in C++. Now, you guys understand? So, so Jacqueline, for... I uh, didn't appreciate that uh, MATLAB copies uh, the values into like an intermediate uh, yes. and then uses that. Uh, why, why is this like, why wouldn't the uh, MATLAB use uh, direct access to the values? Because they don't distinguish between copying by value and copy by reference. Uh, there is no this mechanism in MATLAB. If you if you if you pass well, what do you mean copying by value and by reference. So like, copying by value means that if you pass a variable to a function, 
Oh. Then the function creates a local copy of that variable, and mm. then you operate with that copy within the function. Mm. Right? I see. That is copy by value. Yeah. So copy by reference is that you refer to the location where the value is stored. Exactly. And there is no, actually there's no copy, right? You're just no working copy. with the actual object that you pass into the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, the, and then the pointer is just the address. Yes. Location. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is, however, okay, so this is extremely important when you speed up, to speed up a code where you're passing around big data structures, right? You always want to pass by reference because you save lots of time in doing this. Uh, there, is a, there, is, there is, however, a danger with this. And the danger is that if I pass a reference to an object, to a function, right? Because I'm passing the actual object, let's say in this case, x1, that function have, having access to the actual object could modify the actual object by accident, right? And you may want to protect against the behavior of the function, taking your original object as an input. You see the problem? This problem does not, is not there if you copy by value, right? Because the function makes a local copy of your object. And, um, and so there is, no, there is no such an issue. Right? Yeah, go ahead. So the, the reference is actually just, um, This has nothing to do with templates. This has to do with passing something to a function. You have two options. Pass by value, pass by reference. When you pass by value, the function makes a local copy. When you pass by reference, the function uses the actual object. All right? Sorry, Jacob. So previously, when we didn't have this and yes. on there, it was just copying the Yeah, things. the values of making temporary values, right, of x1, x, y1, z1. Uh -huh. Those values would the used in function but it couldn't touch the original input exactly but now it's just using the same thing huh? exactly okay. right so now the danger is that say that and again this is a simple example right so this is not happening this danger is not happening here but say that x1 was a very large data structure and you're passing it by reference to a function and maybe this function is a very long function that has been written by someone else and uh, you don't want to go and read all the lines of the function to make sure that the array you're passing is actually not modified, right? So how can you be sure that the, the, what you pass is not modified? If you look at the signature of the function and in front of the first x1, you see a const here. This means that x1 is passed as a constant reference to a double. Constant means that the compiler will make sure for you that this object x1 is not modified within this function. So you can, okay? So you can pass by value, you can pass by reference. And when you pass by reference, you can pass by normal reference or constant reference. Again, again, this is uh, a level of protection for whoever calls this function to make sure that what is passed to the function is not modified. All right? So constant reference is the best way of doing that. Well, it depends what you want to do. Because in some cases, you want the function to modify your input. Oh. So that the input is actually also an output. You call a function by passing by reference. The function operates on the actual data. Once the function is done, your data is modified. You understand? Yeah. Right. But now, for sure, we don't want this constructor, which is just a special case of a function, to modify x1, y1, and z1, right? 
So we pass by constant. I'm giving you guys all these details because we, when you actually read C++ code written by others, you see all these little things. And so you need to be able to understand uh, what is going on. Um, all right, so now we have all the ingredients. Let's see if we should compile it, right? yeah, no problem. Okay, so now let's say we have some pushbacks, right? Uh, into this vector v1, let's say we have three, right? Uh, with random numbers, let's say in the second line, I put 4.5, 5.8, then I just increase them by one, 5.5, 6.8, 11, right? And then I'm going to print, right? What I pushed in, so I'm going to have a for loop again, and then I'm going to say for k equals zero, k less than v1 dot psi, size, k plus plus. This time I'm going to print out v1k, right? So the kth element of the vector v1 dot x, and then I'm going to put a space, and then I want to print the dot y. space dot z and then end the line right i'm printing element by element and i'm printing the values of these three elements see that works for you meaning the error i don't know what i'm doing that idea so it says i hit this oh, oh do i need to put this in a uh, you're missing commas commas after each point of view. oh commas yeah but the last one, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, can we see your screen? <laughs> <laughs> You guys find this useful? Is it yeah, too, yeah. too yeah. slow or? That's pretty good. Okay. So we haven't gotten to any of the modulus library today, I think, but uh, probably cover it next time. I might cast. Oh, yeah. Are we missing the commas here? Yeah. Oh. Yes, we are in on this. On, for example, in line sixty-three, we are creating an object of this type, my class, and at the same time we push it into okay. the vector of vector. Then later you're creating another one, put it in yeah. the vector. 
but later how would you call it because you don't put any name for this guy so B1. Oh. You access the V1 elements. Oh, so basically it's for zero, it's going to access the look, first one? Look at the code here. You haven't done this part. Oh. Is, is it this part? This part is this part, right? But these three lines you haven't done yet. In this last three lines, I'm looping over the vector V1 accessing the elements and for each element calling dot x dot y dot z oh okay once once you have the vector v1 each element is an element of type my class so for each element you can use the dot x dot y dot z oh that's <laughs> yeah Is there any reason you cannot access? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I cannot have one class and the other one is not. No. Each. Using B, not B1. Oh, okay. Um, Warren, are you? Yeah, how many minutes do you have been before? Right? Okay, uh, you guys want to continue in the afternoon a little bit or four? Yeah, I'm you guys want to do four to five? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so Professor, I guess we're going to continue in the uh, afternoon. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. This is a good sign of enthusiasm. <laughs> a little bit in the afternoon, and uh, and then maybe next uh, Friday could be uh, another session that we get yes. deeper yes. into model life. Yeah. All right, sounds very good. Okay.
See you next week. Okay, so we'll see you guys. Thank you. Bye.